Growing up, I always heard these stories about giant fish in this little creek that my family fished. My dad and my grandpa, they fished this creek for decades, and my grandpa actually had a few of the really big fish he caught from that creek mounted on the wall in his living room. This, of course, was back before those things were kind of frowned upon like they are today. Now, as a kid, I wanted to be just like them, so I spent hours and hours on that creek trying to catch a really big fish. Most of the fish in this creek, though, were in the like 10 to 13 inch range, and all I ever had to show for all my efforts throughout all my years was like a 15 inch brown. It's not a bad fish, but it was nothing at all like the 23 inchers hanging on my grandpa's wall. Which begs the question, what could I have done differently to hook into a bigger fish? Well, that's a really good question, and that's what we're going to answer on today's episode of Untangled. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey folks, how you doing? Welcome to it. This is Untangled. I'm your host, Spencer Durant. Excited to be behind the microphone yet again, instead of out on the water. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. The, the fishing's actually been really good lately, so I've been out a lot because we finally got some stuff done here at VFC. We've been, we've been really busy this summer. It's been awesome, but we've been working on filming more of the beginner fly fishing masterclass. So when you guys get to see the full finished product, I think you'll appreciate it. That's, that's what we've been doing. So I haven't been out fishing for myself as much lately because I've been, been doing that not complaining, right? It's just, it's a different kind of out there on the water experience. But anyways, y'all can, y'all can take a look at that if you want, but let's, let's uh, chat about the show today. We've got some fun topics, I think, coming up today. So stuff that should hopefully pique your interest. Uh, We're going to start off talking about what gear you need to get started fly fishing. The ultimate bucket list fly fishing trips e-scouting for fishing and then like i alluded to in the hook we're going to talk about how to hook into some big fish now as a gen uh, gentle reminder for everybody if you could please keep the questions coming that's what keeps this show going that's what keeps the lights on here in the podcast studio at least so make sure if you've got any questions about fly fishing at all send those on in There's always a link in the podcast description. We love to get those questions from you, and I love answering them. And then if you could, please make sure that you rate the show wherever you're listening to it and make sure that you're subscribed as well. I was actually looking at some of our show analytics the other day, and like 30% of our listeners are not subscribed to the show, which I thought was kind of interesting. So subscribe, please. It it helps. (laughs) It helps a lot more than I think folks realize. Anyways, enough of our housekeeping stuff. Let's just jump right into it. I, I don't think we have too much. But I'm always worried when I start the show, there's something I forgot to tell you or something that, I, that I'm that i forgetting to set up for later in the show, especially when it goes so smoothly and, and quickly like this show's intro did. But I I think we're ready to to grab, grab your Diet Coke, maybe grab some goldfish too, get comfortable because... We're going to settle right in for story time. I want to start story time off this week by putting a request out there. If any of you have a story, any kind of story in particular that you'd like to hear, please let me know. There's, If you listen on Spotify, there's the episode feedback question that you can always fill out in Spotify itself, and I look at those. And you can always just email us, tweet us. Uh, at least I think we're, no, it's not a tweet anymore. Pardon me. You can X us on the, the app formerly known as Twitter. Uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, wherever you want to get a hold of us. If you've got requests for a story, I'd love to hear them. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get started then with this week's story. Something that I'd like everyone to keep in mind as I'm telling this story is I don't think 
most new fly anglers, especially if you're new to fishing for trout. If you've fished for bass, I think you understand this a little bit more, just the nature of bass. But if you've only fished for trout or you've never even fished for trout before and you're coming over to fly fishing, the the predatory nature of trout is something that I don't think is fully appreciated, especially by newer anglers. What I mean by that is trout are actually excellent ambush predators. Some of the best ambush predators that I've ever seen in the water. And when you understand that, I think you can use that, uh, that aspect of their behavior to your benefit when you're trying to catch them. Let me explain a little bit here what I mean. One of the local uh, streams here that I like to fish in this part of Wyoming has a pretty fun mix of fish. It's all brookies up top, and then it's rainbows almost exclusively in the middle, and then it's rainbows and mostly brown trout down in the lower section. And those brown trout down in the lower section, they can get pretty big. I was out fishing with i think alex was here actually we were filming a little bit alex and his wife were here and we were out on the water and i was just running through a pretty big pool and you could see the water kind of the water kind of pushed against this rock wall and there was a seam from the water hitting the rock wall and then the main current there was a seam right there where there was some slow water right next to that rock wall and you could see where the rock wall kind of cut under almost like an undercut bank itself and you could see this like little shelf that you just looked at it and you knew oh yeah that's a place the fish are going to hang out right it's like if you see ever see a food truck you know palling around anywhere that sells wings you know i'm going to be there for it right so (laughs) it it was one of those situations where it just looked super fishy and we, we couldn't pass it up so i threw a drift in there and sure enough, I saw the flash as a fish as soon as my, I was fishing a hopper dropper. So as soon as my hopper got in front of that ledge, the, I saw a flash of a fish and this trout darted out and just smacked that nymph. I was fishing a big stone fly nymph. Hit that thing like it stole something from it. I set the hook and pulled it in. And it was a nice fish. It was probably 15, 16 inch brown trout. Nothing, nothing amazing, but a really, really solid fish. But it was, it was the moment that that nymph came within the view of that little shelf, that little pocket area, that that fish just came out and smacked it. And again, that's very predatory behavior, but I think it's overlooked sometimes, especially the ambushing side of it. They love to just sit there and ambush when they can. And another example, growing up in Utah, there are tons of high country lakes that we would fish and we'd fish with the boy scouts i was in boy scouts growing up and i I got my eagle so fellow eagle scouts out there you know when we say i got my eagle what we really mean is our mom got our eagle for us Uh, so thanks mom if you're listening to the show i appreciate it anyways we were out on this scouting trip and we're on this little little pond not not very big maybe like five to ten acre pond pretty small little spot and water's crystal clear and there's a bunch of sunken logs everywhere and you could see in these logs big tiger trout this this particular pond had tigers and cutthroat at the time were the only thing in there and you could see these big tiger trout sitting directly underneath the log and their eyes you could kind of watch their eyes scan either sides of these big logs and if you dropped your we were fishing a lot of jigs if you drop your jig right down there the fish would look at it immediately and they'd kind of dart out from under their cover and because the water's crystal clear they can see us too so they dart out see us and then they go back but that speaks to their very predatory nature right they're sitting there they're holed up under cover and they're waiting for something to swim by that they can ambush that they can go out and just hit so that is Part of a trout's behavior that, like I said, I don't think a lot of us fully appreciate enough. We don't acknowledge it enough because if we did, I think we'd do things more often to try and trigger that predatory response. 
that that's a lot of why fish hit streamers trout especially it's less of a oh i'm hungry and that looks perfect and more of a predatory response hey get off my lawn (laughs) sort of response so just keep those things in mind hopefully uh those two little stories you know paint the picture of maybe what you can expect as you try to trigger that predatory response from some fish but enough of the stories let's jump into the questions that we've got on this one we're going to start off our questions this week with a short question and for those of you who are new here to untangled which we actually have uh quite a few new listeners lately so thanks a bunch for tuning in to untangled hopefully you're you're laughing you're enjoying yourself and Hopefully my dad jokes aren't driving too many folks away. Uh, I've been told that they're good, though, so that's why I keep keep making them. And if they're not, well, I, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure the audience will let me know. But we do have these short questions that we try to do. These are questions that may not require uh, an in-depth, you know, five to ten minute long answer, but they're still very much worth answering and explaining. And I do love when folks send these in. They're just a great little way to start us off, and they answer questions that not only you have, but I'm sure plenty of other anglers have as well. So that's what our short questions are, and we're taking one today. Mia from Illinois writes in and asks, what is all the equipment I would need in order to start fly fishing? Well, that's a wonderful question, Mia, and I appreciate you uh, asking that. It can be kind of it can be kind of intimidating, I think is the word that I'm looking for, to ask folks you know, who are in the business of gear like we are, you know, what do I need to start? It's like when you walk into a new restaurant that you've never been to before, and you look at the menu, and it's just a billion choices, and you look at the person behind the counter, and you're like, okay, well, what's good here? Right? You're putting faith in them to not steer you wrong. And I appreciate you're putting faith in us like we do in those in those. Uh, in those folks at the restaurant. Speaking of which here, hopefully this isn't, this is a little bit of a tangent, but bear with me. What is up with everybody? Like you go into the restaurant and it's not like a sit down place. You go into the restaurant, you place your order and the person behind the counter, they're just taking your order and you hand them your card. They flip the little screen around to you. Every single one of those asks for you to give a tip now. Or is that just me? I don't think it is because I see that everywhere I go. And I tip my servers. When I go to a sit-down place, I tip my servers and I try to tip well. You know, I'm, I don't have the money <laughs> to tip as well as I'd like. But I, I always leave a tip, try to do my best with that because it's, it's a tough gig. But why, why is everybody thinking they should get a tip just for taking my order? I mean... You stand behind the counter, you take my order, and you hand me my drink. But it just doesn't feel tip-worthy to me. Maybe I'm completely off base. Anyways, I need to get back to answering the fly fishing questions here. So, Mia, you asked about gear. Well, we've got the answer for you. The second video in our Beginner Fly Fishing Masterclass is all about the gear that you need to go ahead and get started with fly fishing. I've linked that in the podcast description so that you can get a visual representation and not just my dulcet tones uh, uh, sliding over the airwaves like silk, as I described the gear that you need. Uh, In addition, we do sell starter packs that have all the gear that you would need to get started as well. I've linked those in the podcast description too, just in case you're curious. But to answer your question, the stuff that you need to absolutely start is a rod, a reel, some line, some flies, some fly boxes, your accessories like split shot, floatant. Then you need some waders, some boots, and some sunglasses. These are your must-have items. If you're going to go out and fly fish, you need this stuff. If you don't have it, it's going to make your experience less than enjoyable, and you probably won't stick with the sport too long. So these are your basics. Make sure you have them before you go out, and you'll love it that much more. Thanks a bunch, Mia. Appreciate you taking the time to write that question.
All right, next question comes to us. JT from Texas writes in and says, First, love the show. Very entertaining and informative. I just got back from a road trip, Texas to Colorado Rocky Mountain National Forest, to Yellowstone National Forest, to British Columbia, Canada, to Grand Canyon, Arizona, back to Texas. I managed to sneak away from my wife a few times and got some fishing in. I mentioned all the locations because it got me thinking. Are there any iconic or bucket list type places that someone should make it a goal to visit and fish? P.S. Coke products are swill and probably give cancer whiskey for the win. If your students are anything like I was, you definitely deserve a stiff drink. JT, thanks. <laughs> you know, my students are pretty good, actually. I can't complain. So it's been pretty good teaching-wise. So it sounds like you had a really epic road trip, but you know, I almost threw your question out because of the Coke slander. I will not abide it. I will not abide Coke slander because, uh, man, let's make sure the Coke label's facing the camera. Uh, you know, we're open to sponsorships from Coca-Cola on this show. So get in touch with us, live real life adventures, flyco.com. Anyways, <laughs> uh, Coke, you know, I, I said I was done, but one more thing. Coke really might be the nectar of at least some minor gods. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there and step away. As for your question, JT, yes and no. Yes, there are places that I think everyone should visit and fish, but no, not everybody's going to agree with me on where. For example, I don't think that everybody should go to Labrador to fish for big brook trout. I just, I don't know that that's an experience that every fly angler is going to love, but I bet a majority of the fly fishing community disagrees with me on that. This is a fun question, though. So. I figured I'd give you all my bucket list of destinations and a reason why I want to fish in each of those places. What what draws me to it a little bit. So some of the really out there stuff that's just stupid expensive and it's probably not realistic unless I win the lottery or, you know, start, I, I don't know, doing something crazy. I mean, people sell the most outrageous things these days it's just nuts and you, you think to yourself man i'd love to get in on that but then you think no i've got some dignity i can't so <laughs> if i ever have the money though time in mongolia the biggest member of the trout family 100 percent want to get those arctic char and brown trout in iceland that just looks incredible tiger fish in the okavango river delta in africa uh, those tiger fish look like so much fun. I'd love to get into one of those. And then Dorado in Bolivia. I think out of all of those, probably the Bolivia one's the most realistic. Those Dorado look like a ton of fun. A, a good buddy of mine fished for Dorado a bunch and said they are just the best fish, the funnest fish he's ever caught on a fly rod is what he told me. Now, as for the more realistic stuff, if I was going to put together a bucket list of North American focused, like these are the places to go. Trout focused as well. This is this is the list I came up with. I spent a I spent a little bit of time on this. All right, the Green River below Flaming Gorge. It is one of the most amazing places on this planet. Everybody should go visit it at least once. Any of the Madison, the Big Hole, or the Yellowstone rivers that really treat you to the Best of Montana, in my opinion. The Lower Provo. Everybody needs to go hit the Lower Provo, man. I love it. Uh, the South Fork of the Snake in Idaho and or the Henry's Fork. I prefer the South Fork. I said, I think it was last week's episode, I'm not the biggest fan of the Henry's. So, and I'm sure that's going to earn me all sorts of slander. But if I had to pick between the two, I would fish the South Fork. Uh, it's just... Uh, I don't. I, I like the cutthroat. Is really what it what it comes down to. Uh, the Missouri River in Montana, got to do that for some of those big fish. Some of the dry fly and streamer action on the Missouri can be really tough to beat. Uh, the Miracle Mile and the Gray Reef in Wyoming, some probably Wyoming's best tailwaters. Miracle Mile and the Gray Reef, Florida Keys. If, if you're going to do saltwater stuff, I don't know where else you'd want to start in America other than the Florida Keys. Tons of opportunities, lots of interesting things there. Uh, the Catskills in New York and then central Pennsylvania. That region's so 
critical to the the uh, growth of the sport here in America and so many so many techniques and flies were invented over there it it really is the the ancestral home of trout fishing in America so it it's it needs to be on the list you, you've got to go see it it's like saying that you love living in the west but then you actually you know never go to Wyoming or Colorado or New Mexico or Arizona and see like the real West, you know, you've got to go see it. Uh, some backcountry Rocky mountain adventures. I think everybody needs those. The Rockies are, I mean, I, I could never move away from the Rockies as much as I love Alaska and the mountains in Alaska. The, the Rockies, I, I grew up in them. My family's been here for five generations. I, I don't think I could ever leave the Rockies. So there, there, there's a magic in these mountains that is hard to find elsewhere. And then lastly, the Kenai and the Russian rivers in Alaska. The rainbow trout fishing and the salmon fishing on both of those rivers can just be really incredible. And if you're going to go treat yourself to, it almost feels like an international trip, but it's not, then that's a, that's a spot that I'd, I'd highly recommend checking out. But something else I thought of, too, as I went through, you know, here, here's a bucket list, right? Now, I could have added more, and I'm sure people are, are, are clutching their pearls right now. And I can't believe that you left uh, the middle Provo off of that list. Or, or where's the Al Sable on that river? What about the drift list? And yeah, I, I understand. I'm not, I'm not, if I didn't include something on here that you love, I'm not saying that it sucks. Because... <laughs> as I was going through and putting this list together, I really thought that maybe the best way to go about something like this would be to focus more on specific regions instead of specific fisheries, with the exception of some of the ones that I've mentioned and these big name rivers like the Madison, where you want to go do it at least once just to say that you've done it. And then, you know, you you decide if you come back to those. At, at a later date. But the reason that I say maybe pick a region instead of a fishery is this. I was I was in northern Idaho with a buddy of mine, with my buddy Ryan McCullough, and we were a, we were by a whole bunch of North Idaho's most famous trout water. And we fished some of that stuff and it, it was good, but we ended up turning up this dirt road and driving up this little tributary stream for a while. And we, we got off and we fished down in there and I caught bigger cutthroat there than I did anywhere else. So the fishing in that little stream was so much better than the, the, the big name rivers around that it really kind of, kind of changed how I think about these sort of things. And I think part of it, part of the pull to these places is the mysticism and the romanticism of going, and yeah, I was on the Madison, right? Who, who doesn't want to say that? You know, I caught that on the Madison. That, it just flows, right? <laughs> there, there's a romantic ideal about these places, and they are truly great fisheries in their own right. But I think a big pull to places like this is not just the river itself, but the surroundings, the environment, the landscape that it's in. And yes, the fish are a big draw as well, but that landscape and catching trout in that kind of environment is what pulls a lot of us to certain places. And you can usually find really good fishing off the beaten path. So I would say, go ahead, pick a region, do a little bit of research and find places that that maybe aren't the big name rivers that you can go have just as much fun in. And you might find that's a better way to put together like a bucket list type trip than going to every single big, big name, famous river that we've heard so much about. But if I had to put together a bucket list, though, of must visit places, I would be really hard pressed to list anything else in what I did answering this question. So hopefully that answers it for you, JT. Uh, Thanks a bunch for sending that question.
So this next question comes to us. I don't know that we've had somebody from New Mexico write in yet. And if we have, I'm sorry, but I think, I think this is a first from New Mexico. So Joe from New Mexico writes in and says, this is my first year fly fishing and your podcast has been a great help. Thank you for all you do for the fly fishing community. I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico and fish mostly the upper Pecos watershed. This river is full to the brim with six to 14 inch rainbow cutthroat and brown. But every once in a while, I hear a story about a Goliath fish being caught. I actually hooked into mon- one monster fish and snapped my line due to inexperience wrangling such a big boy. My goal is now to exert my revenge and catch one of these trophy fish myself. My question is this. Are there any specific approaches that would increase my likelihood of hooking a larger fish? The majority of my success has come from dry dropper setups and my one big fish that I lost, I was using an indicator nymph setup. Coincidence? Thanks again, tight lines. But Joe, this is a fantastic question. And yeah, answer super simple to hook into big fish. Just use some dynamite. No, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, I, that's, uh, I've heard that phrase like, oh, what were you fishing with? Well, flies. Oh, you should have tried dynamite. I've heard that from so many people that apparently it must be a thing. Uh, it bothers me though. It's one of those little things that that gets under my skin that that shouldn't. Or when somebody asks you, you know, do you fish? You say, yeah, fly fish. Oh, I tried that once. It just ain't as good as fishing worms. It's like okay, I I didn't ask whether it was good. I didn't ask for your validation. I just told you what I do. I said nothing other than literally, hey, I just I fly fish. So, anyways, I'll get off my. I'll get off my little soapbox there for a minute. Uh, Joe, let me answer your question with a little story. So I used to fish the Green River a bunch back when I lived in Utah. I I would fish out there more than somebody who doesn't live near it probably should. And I'm actually really good friends with a local guide there. His name is Ryan Kelly. Uh, you've seen him in this most recent uh, buffet series from Gilbert Rowley over at Capture Adventure Media. If you haven't watched those videos, go check them out now. They're fantastic. Anyways, Ryan is the fishiest guy I know. He's incredible. I, I don't have the words to describe Ryan's fishing skills because they're, they're just next level. They are, he is the James Bond and we're all a bunch of Jason Bournes. All right. We're, pale imitations of it and yes jason Bourne is nowhere near as good as james bond i will fight anybody on that one (laughs) anyways uh ryan was telling me this is a a while ago the day before i got to his house for a trip someone caught like a 13 pound brown trout right at the boat ramp beneath the dam there at flaming gorge and i'm pretty sure it was a, a 13 pounder i might be misremembering details that's the detail that came to mind But we were both really shocked at that, not because of the size of the fish. We know there's big browns like that in the green, especially right there next to the dam. But we were really surprised because somebody actually caught it right there. That river has 12,000 fish per mile in the first seven miles of the river. So your chances, I want you to think about that for a minute. Your chances of putting your fly in front of that big fish, one out of 12,000, when that fish is actually ready to eat, are infinitesimal. How, how do you measure your chances that small? You know, it's, uh, there's a joke in there about size, but I'm not going to make it. Anyways, fish like that, the way that they probably eat, they probably just gobble up like two to three smaller trout per day and they're done feeding. They're really not going to go out of their way for insects at that point. They're almost exclusively eating other fish. And they got big because they're using their energy the most effectively, and that would be swallow a bunch of little fish and then go back and sit on the bottom and not move, right? So what does this have to do with your fish? Well, it's the same concept in that if you're going to hook into these fish, into these bigger fish, You need to put in a ton of time, but not just time. You need to put in time with the right flies in the right places at the right time of day. 
Yes, there is a certain amount of luck involved, but there are some things that you can do to put luck a little bit more on your side. And this stuff's going to apply not just to Joe's example there in New Mexico, but to everybody who's listening that's fishing for trout. Before we dive into the specifics, though, I do think it's important to touch on the overall theory of this idea. I've, I've poked at it a little bit, but the idea of when we're trying to target big fish, how much of a difference do our attempts make when we're trying to change up our, our tactics to go after only big fish? Does it really make a difference or not? Because there, there are schools of thought on that, that you're going to catch what you're going to catch, and there's no real way to, to increase your chances at big fish. And then there's folks who say, no, there are ways to increase your chances of hooking into big fish. So Dom Swintoski over at Troutbit, and he has a really good article on this entire topic. I've linked to it in the podcast description, but I want to read an excerpt from that post of his because it sums up my thoughts exactly on, like I said, on the theory behind catching and hooking into, not just catching, I keep using that phrase, on hooking in to big fish. So Dom writes that, I still believe that large trout don't need more than a good presentation, but what is good may actually be pretty special, meaning it's rare to find the skill level necessary to consistently get good drifts and put them over trout, large or small. Some guys are good at tight line nymphing but have no dry fly game. Some girls can play in a streamer in the bullseye but can't dead drift a thing. Big trout can be anywhere, and they might eat anything. So we need precision casting and an ability to feed S-curves into the tippet leash of a rusty spinner. We also need the facility to tuck cast a 16 bead head into the two-foot froth and get a 10-foot drift before it plunges over the lip. The best big trout anglers are good at all of this. So what do we, what do we make from that, from Dom's, from that excerpt from Dom's story? Well, in my mind, that is to say that, yes, there are things that you can do to put luck on your side when you want to hook into a big fish. Knowing how to get great drifts and putting them in the right places, that's what's going to separate you from just pure luck into actually being able to take this and turn it into big fish hunting mode. Because if your drifts are all just kind of meh, it doesn't matter if you're fishing the right fly at the right time in the right place. The big fish is going to ignore it if your drifts aren't really good. But if you can if you can get your skills to that point, then you actually do increase your chances of hooking into the bigger fish. I, I think I told the story, it might have been last week or a couple weeks ago, about my buddies Brian and Chris who fish mouse flies for really big trout at night. What they've done is they have developed a singularly unique and really fantastic skill part of which is staying awake all friggin' night long. I can't do it, like I, like I said in that story. But they use that skill to put themselves in the best situation they possibly can to catch those big fish. And still, I think that Brian told me once, he gets one 30-inch trout per summer. Now, that sounds awesome, right? Would you? I think all of us would say, yeah, I'll take a 30-incher every summer. But that's before you realize that he's out fishing at night, two to three nights a week. And out of all of that effort, he has one truly big fish to show for it all. Right? Even with all of his skills, there's still an insurmountable amount of luck involved that makes it really tough to say that, yes, do X, Y, and you're going to get Z. It, it's, it's tough. So, anyways. Theory out of the way, what can you do? What can you do if your skills are there? What are the things that you can do to put yourself in the best situation possible to actually catch those big fish? Well, Joe, you actually hit it on the head when you realize that you caught your big fish with a nymph. You were down where that fish was, and big fish get big because they prioritize feeding efficiently over anything else. They don't spend more energy than they have to in order to eat. 
So your first thing that you need to do is you, you want to fish bigger flies that are going to be a more enticing meal for these bigger fish. We hear that all the time. You want to catch big fish, fish big flies. Streamers are great for attracting bigger fish because bigger fish eat more and more streamer-sized meals than smaller fish do. Now, I've never fished the Pecos, but from what you're describing to me, it sounds like maybe smaller water, pretty similar to what I have here in Wyoming. So you don't need to throw like a six-op meat whistle streamer. Uh, that's probably going to be way too overkill. You want to fish a big streamer, but not too big. So your best bet is, you said there's a bunch of six to 14-inch fish in that river. Maybe a two to three inch streamer is the size of a lot of fingerling trout. And that's probably what uh, some of the bigger trout are going to eat. So try and try and match the size of that streamer to what you think is a realistic fly for other fish to eat. Now, the second thing that you can do, you need to fish the right spots. Big fish, they own the prime feeding lies. They are first in line at the buffet every day. And they're large and in charge. They know it, and they ain't afraid to throw that weight around and boot out the little fish. They are often going to be in water that's really tough to fish because not only is it a great feeding lie, but it's very heavily protected, so no other predators can get to them. Tight, quick eddies, undercut banks, beneath really big logs. Think all the stuff that eats your flies. You look at it and think, yeah, I want to drift there, but I don't want to lose all those flies. That's where you've got to drift. You've got to figure out how to level up your skills, like we've been talking about, to get drifts in there without losing your flies. Last thing, focus on the time of day. You've got to fish when those big fish are most likely going to be out and about and eating. For your river, it would probably be overkill to night fish. My buddy, where my buddy Brian fishes that I was, I was talking about earlier, it's not because it's, a, it's big water, and those really big fish are probably only eating at night anyways. For you, though, Joe, I would focus on fishing during the best times, early morning and then right at dusk. When the hatches are thick, fish are moving, including the big ones, especially since big on your creek probably means like a 20 to 22-inch fish. I I'm not trying to shortchange it at all. And that's, that's a good fish. That's a good trout. But your 20-inch trout is different than your 30-incher because your 20-incher is still probably going to eat insects. Probably a 50-50 balance of insects and then other fish. So that's why we make the distinction here. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to tell you, oh, your fish aren't that big. <laughs> that's not where I'm coming at it from. I'm coming at it from a, a forage base, right? You've got to realize what those fish are likely going to be eating. So don't overlook fishing during a great hatch for that big fish because there is a chance that they'll still come up and eat a dry fly. I've caught some of my best fish, including a 24-inch rainbow here in Wyoming, during blue-winged olive hatches. Tiny mayflies, but sometimes big fish will just come up for them. So hopefully that answers your question. There are things you can do to increase your chances of catching the big fish. Really, though, a lot of it comes down to luck, a lot more luck than we ever want to admit. But if you do those three things and your presentations are good, you are going to set yourself up for success and you do increase your chances of hooking those big fish. All right, folks, we are on the last question of this week's show. Comes to us, Jacob from Montana. Writes in and says, I use satellite mapping and imagery extensively when it comes to finding new locations to hunt. I'd like to apply that to fishing, but I am early enough in my fly fishing journey that I'm not exactly sure what I should be looking for to mark certain areas. What e-scouting tips do you have for us? I really dig the podcast and newsletters. Thanks for all the great info. Hey, Jacob, thank you. I appreciate that you enjoy this stuff so much. Uh, this is a really interesting question, and I'm liking the way that you're thinking about this. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of these lately where y'all have thought about things in, in new and interesting ways. I really like that. So if you've got 
stuff like that. Definitely send it on into the podcast. I, I love this stuff. So, to answer your question, Jacob, what I've found, especially with fishing, it's a lot harder to scout out like a a certain hole on a river on Google Maps or whatever you're using because the river is always changing. Unlike uh, unlike when when you're scouting for big game, the river's always changing. If the flows are lower or higher, there might be riffles there one day and then a pool there the next day. It's really tough to nail down exact specific spots, especially on a river where you're where you want to go fish. What it is great for though is finding the little fisheries that you never visited. For example, I was looking at this was oh oh probably I was still living in Utah, so at least how long have I lived in Wyoming now? One, two, two and a half, two and a half years in Wyoming. So I was still in Utah, so at least three years ago. Uh, I was looking at the map of this big river that drains the south slope of the Uinta Mountains back in Utah. And that river dumps into a big lake. And about three miles up above that lake, two different little creeks enter the river. Now, what I did is I hiked all the way to the mouth of those creeks and I fished them both up off the main stem. And I got a bunch of awesome fish, including some grayling out of a river, which is pretty rare in Utah to get them out of the river. So that was fun because I looked at the map, I saw where those creeks came in, and then I went and fished them. So that's one way that you could use it. Uh, I've also used it since I moved here to Wyoming to look at different lakes in the mountains here and figure out the best way to get into those lakes. Your best success with, with e-scouting, I think, is looking up new places to fish and then figuring out access to those areas, how you're going to get in there and you know, where, where can I park the truck? You know, can I bring my float tube in here? Is it too long of a hike or, or whatever it is? Instances like that. Another way that it will help, I just thought of this, another way it's going to help is finding meadow sections of streams that you would need to hike into to reach. I love fishing meadows, especially up in the high country. They're not always the best fishing, but I just love them. They're one of my favorite places to fish. And you can find those on maps easily enough. So you can, you know, oh, there's a meadow. The stream more than likely is going to be very slow and windy and deep through the meadow. So that's the kind of fishing that you can expect in a meadow section. So it does help. The e-scouting thing definitely helps if you're looking for a certain stretch of river that you'd like to fish. I would also see it helping immensely when you're looking to see if there's a bank in this section or if it's just a sheer canyon wall, you know, access to the river again, that's that sort of thing. So again, I'd say look less for specific holes and more for the larger stretches of water. Use it to help you find water that you haven't seen before. I think that's where the benefit in e-scouting really lies. And with that, folks, we've come to the end of yet another episode of Untangled. Thank you for listening along to the show. I appreciate it. Berkeley appreciates it. Alex appreciates it. Our moms appreciate it because... You know, we're making money for ourselves now and we're not begging them for money anymore. So it really is, you know, you're, you're not just helping us out. You're helping our moms. So thank you. <laughs> but like always, if you've got any questions that you want answered on the podcast, please go ahead, send those in. There's a link in the podcast description. Please rate and subscribe to this show wherever you're listening to it. Apple, Spotify, YouTube, uh, via the Pony Express. I don't know if you can listen to podcasts there, but probably make sure you do that. It helps us out a ton. And until next week, everybody, tie lines. <laughs>